Welcome to the Snap No Tap Podcast. I'm Tony Cicchini. I'm Joe Cardinal. Nico Indovino. Welcome, guys. How was your week? Joe, what was up this week with you? Well, um, I became one of the cool kids this week. I uh, actually went and got uh, a COVID test. So um, I was actually feeling a little under the weather. You know, I felt like um, nothing major, just like minor cold symptoms, sore throat, just a little bit, you know, and tired at the evenings. Normally I'd blow that off, but I was like, geez, I know some people who I, if this is the, if this is the big one, I shouldn't be around. You know, I've got some family members who are older and more vulnerable. So yesterday I pulled the plug and decided to get the, uh, the old uh, Q-tip test, which was as bad as they, if you've seen the video, it feels just as bad. It was a, it was a nice way to cap off the week. So I haven't got the results yet. That'll be that'll stay tuned till next episode to see if Joe has COVID. Is uh, it true that they told you not to wear a mask and instead put a bag over your head? No, I usually get that kind of advice from my family, but uh, you got a good family there, buddy. Yeah, um, but yeah, it actually went down like this. They, um, you know, you pull up in the car and you have the mask, and they they come out. And the guy sticks the thing, you know, the, the, the plunger way up my nose. And he's like, all right, I'm going to count to 10. And so I brace myself and I'm trying to chill out, even though it's horrible, right? It's way up in my sinuses. And he goes, one, two, three, four. Oh, oh wait, let me start over. One, two. So I was just, my eyes were watering. It was, it was messed up. So something maybe, hopefully you guys won't have to look forward to that. But I'm not doing that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I was debating it, but I'm like, oh man, I got to go into work and I got to, like I said, I got some people and my, you know, members, families and friends who I should not expose if this is a thing. So, so that was the end of my week. What about you, Nick? I just had a busy week with work. Nothing, nothing new really. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm not going to want to take no test. I don't want to be around anyone that may expose me to it. So. They could take that test and keep it. <laughs> yeah, I was de- I was definitely hesitating, man. But I was like, oh. Well, at least at least you were outside, and you you didn't have to go sit in line with a bunch of people that you know had the COVID to True. go take the test. A to me, that like, defeats the purpose. Yeah, a lot of them do like drive through. That's basically what we did. We dr- we you know, had car spaces far apart. They did it in the parking lot, and so I wasn't near anybody except a guy in like a hazmat suit. So. Um, well, pretty safe. So except, until he until he put the uh, the stick up my nose, then things changed. But <laughs> so a pretty big target there. So you know the guy to miss. You know that's right. You know I thought he. Well, that's I think his problem was is he was fishing around so much trying to find you know like a contact point. It's just too much, too much space. Yeah, I mean. I was thinking that maybe with the nostrils that you have, and if you ever hit a financial crisis, you could probably rent your nose out for parking space. I mean, think about it, especially in a city. Parking is a premium. Or just like storage space, maybe. More like, you know, like a storage locker kind of a scenario. Yeah. Locker. Valu- valuables. I what mean, I- I can't, if you put something up my nose, I can't guarantee you'll get it back. That's the problem. Well, at least you'll be checking the inventory every day. I know you, you know. <laughs> Hey, man, you got a clean house, buddy. Right, I'm sure of that. Well, actually, when I had to put my mom in the hospital um, a couple months ago, they um, she had to get a COVID test. And it's a long story. I don't, no need to get into it. But, you know, the lady, uh, she tested negative. So that's, that was good. You know, um, she's pretty isolated with the, with the Alzheimer's and everything. But, uh, yeah, it's been a um, 
relatively quiet week. I found out one of my friends is moving back into Chicago on Tuesday. Um, so uh, I won't be seeing him. He doesn't, he lives about, currently he lives a half hour for me, um, which is, I only have two close friends out here. So he will not no longer be a close friend as far as geographically. He'll, as I said, he'll be moving back to Chicago on Tuesday. Um, so he'll be a good hour and a half, two hours away, depending on traffic. That kind of stinks. But, uh, hey, I got a couple of emails from guys, again, uh, interested in joining the Tri-C program, which is my distance learning program. I've been emailing them back and forth. Um, one of them lives uh, in uh, out of the country. And, you know, he was saying that they're going to be on a no flight or whatever you want to call it. Can't come and go for about a year. I'm like, well, you should still join because, you know, the whole point is to train, dis you know, via video distance. And um, every time I want to close the program, something comes up. Now it's more important than ever. Um, so I told him I'm only going to allow about three people, you know, uh, because of um, it's a, a big project for me. And I'll probably send out a mass email um, within the next uh, few days. And, uh, you know, so I'm pretty much telling people, if you want to do it, do it. I've been doing this distance thing for over a decade. So and we have it down pat. And uh, and that's something. Uh, and then what else for me? Uh, really nothing. This was a pretty uh, just a get stuff done week. And, uh, you know, now beginning of the month, I always try to, figure out what am I going to do this month. So, but anyway, it's good to see you guys. Good to see you. Any updates, Nico, on when you're moving? Uh, no updates so far. I'm just getting everything ready to uh, show the house. Yeah, good luck with that, man, for real. For Thank real. you. You know, I was thinking about what you said about training, Tony, and, and the, the kind of – things are actually better now for remote learning than they were previously because of like with Zoom, you can do it interactively because in some ways, like if they can't travel now, it seems beneficial that you could do a lot of prep work before you come out, you know? So instead of people showing up and you have to evaluate them, you know, a lot of, it seems like timing wise. No, it never was like that, Joe. I always did it via video uh, where I filmed something for them or they would film themselves working out, upload it to me. Mm -hmm. So I always knew from day one uh, what their abilities are, what their weaknesses are. And then from there, I structure a training program. So it was never like you're intimating that it was uh, blind when they showed up. Never like that at all. Um, normally with these people, they would go through months of training with me before they even showed up in Chicago. And some never even came to Chicago because they lived you know, in another country and, you know, just wasn't able to. So that won't change anything. Um, the only thing with this Zoom or Skype or whatever you'd, you'd want to use is maybe I could watch them while they're in the gym live. But uh, still, what it does, what I do is, you know, I assess your ability, see where you're at. Then I structure a, a lesson program. Let's just say I teach you how to throw the jab, right? And I want you to practice the jab. So you do it. You take a week, two weeks, whatever, three weeks, whatever it is. And then you film yourself when you're comfortable. You upload it or however you we want to do it now. And then I'm like, okay, you, you did that. Uh, if there's any corrections, I tell them what to do. And then we move on to the next lesson. And I'm just using that jab as a, you know, just as an example. But it could be anything. Takedowns, pins, escapes, whatever. Um, and then plus they have, all, they'll, they'll, they get access to all of my video products uh, via download. So they'll they'll have things that I'll tell them to practice. Like, you know, on the law start of hooking where I'm showing how to do the head and arm, you know, do that, you know, make sure you keep your head down when you're holding the guy, blah, blah, blah. And it really works well because the people can take their time and normally they'll have a training partner. And even if they don't, we can still do solo. Um, but if they have a training partner, it helps them because it defrays their cost. So they can uh, take the program and cut it in half financially. And he, you, let's say you and your training partner will, split the costs. Um, but yeah, nonetheless, it's, uh, you know, um, it's a terrific way to learn. And again, you learn at your own pace and it's, you know, it's, I don't know. I'm pretty sure I was the first one to do it. Uh, for sure. I know I'm the only guy 
that allows people to come to my house and stay rent free when they're here training, you know, so you don't have to pay for a hotel room. Uh, they don't have to get a rental car because I pick them up at the airport and so on. But yeah, even without the, um, you're right about one thing though. Now, if they would start training and, and really getting into it via video, by the time the COVID ban lifts worldwide, they should be pretty sharp and they should at least get, they should be physically in condition um, when they come out here. Uh, so yeah, that's something to think about. Uh, I'll probably, we're going to upload this to Facebook um, and we will, I'll put a link down there uh, to this. And again, uh, I hate to sound like a salesman too much, but you have to act quick on this. You have to sign up and join. A lot of people say they're going to join, then they don't, or they want to say, oh, I can make payments, and then they don't follow through with the payments. So no, you know, if you want to join, join. You know, first come, first serve, and, you know, you won't regret it. The minute you join, um, you know, w within that 24-hour period or whatever, you'll get the, the links to my downloads, and I'll make an introductory introductory video like I'm doing now, going more in depth about what I expect. And then, you know, uh, and then we go from there. But um, Nico may have to do something like that because he's, you're probably, how far away, okay, how further south are you planning on moving? Because if you go too far south, you're going to end up in Indianapolis area. No, not Indianapolis, um, but it is going to be pretty far. So I'm planning on going at least an hour south of where I'm at. So to get all the way up by you, uh, that's at another hour. I'm about three hours. Yeah, right. And that's going to be like impractical for <clears throat> Lee lessons like we were doing, um, which kind of sucks. But um, so you're going to say central state right in the middle of Indiana or what are you thinking? Yeah, central. Okay. Central. So I could, I could still drive. If I had to, I could drive up to, you know, the Gary area for work. I could drive down to Lafayette for work. I could even go to like uh, South Bend or Fort Wayne. So I'm kind of in the middle of things and within an hour and a half of anywhere I really need to get to. Yeah, best of luck with that, man. I hope you can move while the weather's still nice, you know, as opposed to like when I had to move here six and a half years ago, it was in the middle of the, well, technically the second worst winter Chicago ever had. And it was horrible. There was over 20 inches of snow on the ground. It was just ungodly. And, um, I don't ever want to, I had to move in the middle of like the second week of February. It's just all oh, horrible, horrible, horrible. And uh, I don't ever want to have to do that again. You know, the one thing you're kind of talking about the uh, kind of prep work with the uh, remote training is that that's kind of harkens back to when you first started with Rod Von, right? Because the first several weeks or months, right? He just had you doing conditioning, correct? Like you didn't get technique for a while. Right. Well, it was, yes, months. And, uh, well, and I, again, too, uh, sometimes our mind plays tricks with us. If you look at me now, you're, you're thinking, oh, hey, Tony's in shape. But back then I was just a skinny kid. Um, and I had bronchitis really bad. And I used to miss a lot of school. I had a lot of health issues, I'm, rheumatic fever and everything. So I wasn't the healthiest of children, okay, uh, at all. So part of it was to build up my strength, you know, um, just, I, now, I, I'm speculating here, but uh, so it was two, twofold. He wanted to get me wrestling strong. Well, he wanted to get me strong, and then he wanted to get me wrestling strong, okay, which is, you know, two different things, uh, believe it or not. So, yeah, I did a lot of exercising, um, lots. And it's ironic because I was, I was a whiz with, with sit-ups. I never had a problem with that. But I had a problem with push-ups. I didn't have a lot of upper body strength and I hated to do push-ups. And then, you know, years go by, I end up setting a world record in the push-ups. So that's kind of ironic how that works, you know, but um, yeah, it was a lot of conditioning exercises and breathing exercises and um, special exercises geared specifically for what we do, okay, uh, to help uh, develop tendon strength, um, special flexibility, not like yoga or splits but special flexibility in your joints and so on with your neck a lot of gymnastic type of things um and it was tough you know uh but it laid a foundation for me and it, it kept me fit um or at least it laid the the groundwork for a lifetime of fitness for me um so it's a it's a lifestyle 
e even now, I'm, I'm not going to, to the gym until things calm down because, you know, I have to worry too about catching something and giving it to my mom who's really, you know, just basically now emaciated. Um, she's lost so much weight and stuff. So I have to be careful with it. But uh, unless I have another terrific accident or something like that, I plan on staying physically fit until the, until the very end. You know, um, we used, I used to talk about this on my Facebook uh, when I used to put up those Facebook daily uh, things about guys like Jack Lillane or Luthez or Stanley Rodvon, who was, you know, doing strongman things in the seven and is in his seventies. And, you know, there are a myriad of guys who, uh, you know, uh, stayed strong, you know, uh, doesn't mean you're going to live to be a hundred, but hopefully your quality of life will be okay. Uh, Boy, I wish I, I wish Kevin was still alive. You know, from the gym, Kevin was a was a testimony. He was a he's as strong as seventy year old guy I ever saw. Okay, I mean, as far as powerlifting strength, he didn't have the grip strength or the freak strength like Rodman's. A different kind of strength. But you know, Kevin was uh, you know, look how he looked. I mean, he looked he looked twenty years younger. And you know, that's how I want to be. I just want to try to keep my weight where it needs to be. Um, but make no mistake out there, you know, you, you, you get your aches and pains and your injuries, but you, you got to try to make sure that they're not life threatening for one. And if they're life altering, well, then you got to alter your life. You, you guys are a little bit younger than me. So especially Nico, I got about 20 some years on you, but you know, um, you've had your share of injuries, but you keep plugging along. <laughs> yeah. I got to keep moving. Would you, would you say that doing those exercises uh, made you healthier? As a kid? Oh, I think, now, again, there's no way to prove this, but I used to miss school a lot every year for my bronchitis. And then after months with Rod Vaughn, I never, I never had bronchitis again, okay? Um, I did miss school from rheumatic fever when I was training with him, but that wasn't because of him. I just, those things, you know. Uh, but, yeah, it certainly made me healthier. Um, it also gave me... Um, confidence you know because all of a sudden I was always into strength okay don't get me wrong I mean there used to be an expression all the world loves a strong man you know I can remember being in grade school wanting to get the Charles Atlas program and watching Jack LaLanne on television you know and all of that and reading books on or magazines whenever from the library on bodybuilders and strength and you know Paul Anderson and the old the old time strong man Herman Gurner um you know Charles Rigolo uh, a pollen, you name it, okay, Eugene Sandow, all of that. Um, but I think what really got me was I had, a, at a time, I had a next-door neighbor, Thelma and Pat, and Pat was a World War II guy, just like my grandfather. Pat was in the Navy, but he was out east, and he would all, always talk about John Grimmick and Steve Stanko. And he just, he always said Grimmick had the better build, but Stanko was incredibly strong. Stanko was pound for pound the strongest man in the world. And he would give me these stories. And I mean, you know, here's a guy from Parkersburg, West Virginia, soft-spoken, had that drawl and everything. And he's talking about Steve Stanko. And man, it just lit a fire under me. I'm like, God, you know, and he'd go on on and on, week after week after week about the feats of strength that Stanko did and what he was capable of doing and stuff. And I'm like, man, I want to be like that. You know, I just want to be as strong as Steve Stanko. So yeah, Nico, I'm certain without a doubt what, what's, what, what, what Stanley showed me, helped me. And then I did side jobs, you know, shoveling snow, cutting grass, just to get little things. And I ended up getting a weight set. Because before that, I had a homemade weight set, which wasn't working too well. Um, and then I started lifting. And, uh, you know, never for size, you know, never to get bulked up or anything. Because I didn't, first of all, I didn't know any better. I mean, I really didn't know. And I didn't, I just had a barbell and a, and a bench. So um, I did make a, um, like a piece of junk universal machine with a push down, lap pull downs, a push down thing. And, but yeah, it was... Um, it was just something, you know, but I was also into other sports like boxing. My, all my instructors did not want me lifting back. This is in the seventies, you know, and 
early eighties there, you didn't lift, you know, and then, um, in high school, you know, running track, cause I was a sprinter. You didn't want to get big, you know, you didn't want to get bulky. I, I had to keep my weight down so I could run fast, but yeah, there's, there's nothing. I've said this before conditioning. There's, there's a difference between having, uh, like aerobic conditioning and having strength and aerobic conditioning, in my opinion, is far easier to acquire than strength. Strength is a commodity and it's something that takes a lot of hard work and years to develop, um, you know, your potential, your top line strength. And, uh, so when you think about it like that, when you have that strength and you've spent years cultivating it, you don't want to throw it away. You know, it's like having a, I don't know, 1969 Chevelle or 1970 SS 454 Chevelle. You don't want to like destroy that car. You want to, you know, upkeep it and, you know, maintain it and everything. So yeah, I've always thought that physical strength was just something to be admired and, uh, and it comes in handy in a lot of other things. So, and, and I try to keep a balance, you know, I wanted to have my cardio conditioning at a good level. I wanted to have my physical strength at a good level and I tried to be balanced. That's all. So what are the, some of the things that Rod Von started you with as far as exercises? Squats. And then we'll, I'll discuss that later. Um, Cause there's a lot of misconceptions about these high rep squats, although I did it and I had guys do it. Um, but within limits, squats, bridging, um, uh, push-ups, various kinds of push-ups, okay? Not just your regular ones, but um, variations. A um, lot of lower body stuff, uh, uh, jumps, uh, you know, I call them, uh, they're on my lucky 13, bottoms up. Uh, and uh, a lot of stuff that would... Oh, working my grip and, and, and of course, working my pull-ups, not pull-ups, chin-ups, working those, the, the biceps, getting your arms strong. Um, and overall, just you wanted to just work your body overall. Uh, so you didn't really have a lot of weaknesses. And then doing things to strengthen your ankles, your joints, basically. So you could, like your ankles... Uh, where you're going to be re able to resist uh, stopper toe holds and such and working on uh, uh, like make my Achilles tendon. I show this on the, um, uh, what is it called? The uh, show versus go series, how you can make your Achilles tendon so strong that you're going to resist Achilles locks and special exercises for the neck. So you can become choke resistant where you can go for, you know, over a minute resisting so much choke. And I used to, demonstrate that at at seminars you know um i would let people slap on that choke and then you know, years go by and talk to a doctor and he's like don't do that anymore it's not good it's not, it's not uh, you know but yeah so th there was a lot of exercises and i shared it with, with uh, some of them on video but others i've kept to just my closest students um and what I see now, and I think we've discussed this before, I see a lot of guys uh, trying to showcase their knowledge of fitness and their training fighters. And while what they're doing is fine, their, their, their physical fitness, it, it isn't geared towards fighting. It's more geared towards showcasing their knowledge. Whereas when you're a coach and you're training a fighter, you've got to make that fighter better. And there's certain exercises that just should not be done if you're a fighter. Everything that you do uh, should be geared towards making you a better fighter. Now, if you want to go off into a powerlifting contest, that's a whole different thing. Go ahead and do it. But don't assume that your powerlifting exercises are going to translate into uh, making you a better fighter because um, many times it just doesn't work out that way. But uh, you have to have a balance too. Um, some hours, sometimes you're going to have to split your hours. You're going to have to do your training in the morning maybe a little in the afternoon and in the evening, um, you'll take like boxing, you know, most fighters, they're not going to do their row work six hours or I mean six miles and then go straight to the gym. You know, they're going to do their, their row work early, in, traditionally early in the morning, if, if possible, as a photosynthesis. And then um, 
maybe that day since they did their six miles, they may not spar that day. They may go into the gym and do bag work and other things like that, work on technique. And then the next day they may uh, spar because they didn't do their road work. So you got to watch when you're doing this that you don't start to overtrain. And out of, you know, the fighters that I've trained that, um, that have come from different gyms or have their own fitness instructors, uh, several times I had to tell these guys, look, man, you're overtraining. Okay, because you're, you're getting blown out on the mat here. You know, your anaerobic conditioning is not there. You're getting gassed. Um, and these are natural athletes I'm talking about, not drug-induced guys who, uh, you know, that kind of bends the – that <laughs> kind of changes things. <laughs> well, Tony, what, what are some of your favorite exercises to develop the anaerobic conditioning? Well, wrestling is in itself very anaerobic. <clears throat> so. Uh, you know, I would do a lot of uh, exercises based on wrestling moves, okay? Um, uh, for Well, one thing, like I would, and this helped my bench press immensely, because you do want to have that upper body strength, is doing like explosive, you know, pops off the chest with the barbell. Um, and uh, when, I, if, if I had, when I had the training partners, which wasn't too often because of, you know, back in the 70s, um, you know, that just I wasn't there. Um, I'd have them rest on my chest and I would do movements and things and a lot of escapes uh, like I've had you guys work on. That's all anaerobic stuff. Uh, and it works, it works really well because it's real live. Or I would have a heavy bag and I'd lay that across my chest in, in lieu of a training partner back in the 70s. Uh, no grappling dummies. And even if they were, they're way too light. Uh, and just, you know, just do, do so many different things. Maybe one of these days, you know, well, it's going to be kind of hard if you're moving, but I was going to say maybe we could video a few things one day, but we'll see what happens. Um, but you do have to have that, that balance. That's just the, the biggest thing. And I've said this a million times before. Work your push-pull muscles, you know, muscles that are going to pull you the guy in, push the guy away. Watch your form. Get those arms as strong as they can be. That's a big weakness in a lot of guys. They don't have strong biceps or arm strength. And arms are so important in grappling, right? Um, work your legs as well. I've had injuries to my low body. I was born with a spinal defect. So I, I've, I've never been a big squatter as far as weights go. Um, I'd get up around 400 pounds and then I couldn't walk for a week, not because of my legs, but because of my back. Um, although it didn't affect my deadlift because – the way with me, it was the weight going across my shoulders that would push, compress my spine. And um, as long as the weight was below, I, I was okay pulling, um, meaning deadlifting. But those are things, and lockouts. There are a lot of lockouts, you know, to help develop the tendon strength. So, um, so Tony, what's lockouts? Oh, well, let's say you're on a bench. You just, okay, let's say my arms are here, and then I will just move the bar two inches maybe, and just hold it in that lockout position. And now you're talking about a lot of weight, okay? Um, so back when I was, for example, benching in the 400s, my ultimate bench was 480 clean, raw. Um, I would do lockouts with over 800 pounds, and, it, and I would do it in a power rack, and plus I had a spotter there. So you're just basically moving it. So you're just moving it a little bit. This is not a way to train every day, okay? I would do lockouts uh like maybe a week every six to eight weeks and man ugh, boy does that hurt i mean it really does you, you you ache and you can do the same thing with your legs um with the lockouts it all i can tell you is it um i i think it played a big role in my benching and i'm not built to bench because i have a shallow chest and i have long arms so for me to bench damn near 500 pounds that to me is probably my greatest accomplishment even though i'm not really proud of a 480 pound bench in general i'm more proud of my my, my strict curls my biceps um because i can match up with anybody with my curls i could not match up with these guys that were benching back then in the 700s and shit um but for me to do it yeah and lifting overhead overhead presses was the same thing you can do the lockouts when you sit down over your head and just do the lockouts and that's all I ever wanted to do. I wanted to lift a lot of weight overhead. And the reason that happened was because of uh, an incident with Stanley Rodman where he got mugged 
and he picked up a guy, three guys, I think it was. He picked up one of the guys over his head and threw him into the other two guys. It made <laughs> paper locally, right? Um, and I just thought that that was something. Uh, I, I don't know why, but I think part of it harks back again to Steve Stanko. When my neighbor would talk about Stanko, these guys didn't never talked about bench pressing, okay? Because the guys in a World War II era, I'm not going to say nobody ever bench press, but that wasn't the thing. It was the Olympic lifts. Um, and for whatever reason it is, just military pressing stuck with me. I wanted to be able to lift a lot of weight overhead. And I don't know if it was my max, but I was able to do three seated behind the neck press. I did 300 for three reps uh, without too much struggle. I never went any higher than that. I never had any desire to try to press 400, but I could have, you know, pressed 350, I think. And you're talking, I was like 215 pounds. So that's pretty good for me. That's enough that I wanted. Um, I, I noticed that when I started lifting more and more, since I never did any kind of drugs ever, my body can only take so much. My structure started to suffer. I started to get freak injuries because I was pushing my body um, to its limit. Okay. Hope that answered your question. I got another one. So when you do the lockouts, how long do you lock it out for? And like, how many reps would you usually do? I would lock them out for 10 seconds. I would try to do that. Um, and, and reps, I didn't do too many of them, you know? Um, well, I actually had hold it for 10 seconds. That's a rep. Okay. So I, in that, in that way I would do one, one rep per set. Okay. Try to do, uh, th three to five sets. Um, I'd have to go look through my journals again, but yeah, I did not, you don't, this, you have no idea how, how this is, how much this hurts. Um, <laughs> because it was like. My bones, I mean, it was going right to my bones. It, it, I was in a lot of agony, but not, um, I never got injured, thankfully. Um, but yeah, so I would do three to five sets of trying to hold it for about 10 seconds. Now, Chuck Sipes, who was a power lifter or was a bodybuilder, but also power lifted, I guess he was trying to be the first guy to bench 600. And he, he weighed about 220. He was about 5'9", so his arms weren't super long. Uh, he wasn't the first to do it, or he didn't get to 600. I think he cheat benched 600, which to me is just incredibly great. I think he did like 580 or something, but he did a lot of these lockouts. Um, but he he looked his body was like, you know, like Mr. Universe. He, he may have even won a Mr. Universe, Mr. America for sure. Um, but it's not for everybody. It's an advanced thing you know i wouldn't start out telling people to do lockouts you know you gotta you gotta get your bench but on the subject of that your form is really important you gotta watch how you do it and you have to do a lot of what's called assistant work um for me heavy tricep push downs okay on a lap machine you know just heavy push downs and weighted dips okay i did a lot of weighted dips um and that coupled with the lockouts help me with my bench probably I don't want to say more than benching itself but I think it did you know just all the assistant work like um I think my overhead presses really did help too with with the uh with the bench because it's all related okay the bench being the flat bench being the well the decline bench being the easiest as far as putting up big poundages, then the flat bench, and then all the inclines, which I never did inclines, by the way. I never did incline benching. I'm not saying there's nothing, something wrong with it. Uh, to be honest with you, we just didn't have an incline uh, bench. Um, so I went from flat bench, and I never did declines either, not even one rep ever. Um, so I would go from flat bench on days, seated, you know, um, military presses on other days. Um, and then, like I told you, every six to eight weeks, I do the lockouts. But three days a week, I was doing all the other assistant work, working my shoulders, my, lat, uh, my, my lats, my uh, triceps. Man, I, I tell you, I, I don't miss those days. It was a lot of hard work. And I mean, I spent hours in the gym, okay? Now my workouts are, you know, done in 30 minutes or so. But um, back then, it was a couple hours of lifting. That's a lot for me. Tony, what did you do for grip strength? Lots of things. 
um, one, anybody can do this. Get a sheet of paper, newspaper, right? And just lay it flat and put your hand in the middle of the newspaper. And you start, without lifting your arm up, just start balling it up, okay? Making a ball out of that newspaper, right? That works really well. Um, another thing was, of course, if you can get good grippers, I mean, grippers will work in a certain way, okay? It, it'll help in, in, in one kind of a, uh, direction, I guess you, you'd say. Uh, holding a chin up position, okay? Like either all the way up here or completely extended, working your grip. Uh, heavy dumbbells, okay? And just holding them. You don't even have to do a farmer's walk. You don't even have to walk with them. Just pick them up and hold them. Um, and then another thing was get like workman's gloves, okay? You can get them for cheap. And you want to slice holes in each finger, like two slits per finger, right? So you got your thumb would have two slits, this one would have two slits, so on. And you put a loop, make it out of, um, you know, some kind of cloth, muslin string, whatever, not string, but, you know, something strong. So now you got a glove with loops and then you take weight and you just like a small weight and you just start lifting like each finger in different kind of directions, right? And then you can start working them in combination and stuff. You got to be very careful here because your fingers are very gentle, uh, delicate. You don't want to get tendon damage. So you don't want to start going stupid. But this kind of harks back to like with, with the music. Musicians for 100 years or whatever, hundreds of years, would do lifting exercises for their fingers, right? To develop strength in their fingers and dexterity and, and uh, finger, what they call finger independence. Well, you kind of want to duplicate that when you're gripping, okay? Because you wanna have just, not just a crushing strength, which is like big now, we're closing those captains of crush grippers, but there's other types of, of, of strength well, as well. So working your fingers in all different kind of directions. Putting your fingers in sand, get a bucket of sand, put them in sand, put them in there like this and start like stretching them out, you know? These four fingers, if you can get the thumb in there, that's fine. Because that's adding resistance. Um, there's, there's other stuff that I used to do too, but those are the, those are the main things. And, and most of them, with the exception of the um, grippers, because those cost you some money, everything else you can almost just do yourself. Fingertip push-ups will help to a degree, or just, just holding that position, holding that uh, um, push-up position uh, will help you. Is that, you know, so those are just some of the things that I used to do. What's amazing to me too about grip strength is you, it's the hand is such a diverse tool is that you can be strong in some ways and not in the other. You know, I, um, uh, I used to do some rock climbing and I developed uh, very amateurish, but I had some endurance and pinching strength. Uh, and I thought I had some pretty good forearms. I think pinch grip. I forgot about that. Pinching the grip, the plates. Yeah. Um, but then I, uh, you know, I came, because you have some specialty machines that Kevin made for you. You know, you load up the plates and it's actually, you, you, you lever when you close your grip. And I didn't have that strength at all. So even though I had some endurance where I could stay on, you know, on a rock wall for a while um, and thought I had at least had some basic strength, you know, it just, it, it is really a diverse type of, uh, of um, conditioning you need for your hands. You were there the day that I blew my, ripped my bicep tendon off my arm there doing the grip machine. Remember? You had, oh, to, yeah. had to take me to the damn hospital and shit. Uh, yeah, that's when I was going for the record strength, man. I mean, and it was just, oh, I don't even want to live that moment because I never did get that thing surgically repaired. It sucks, but, you, you know, you want to, Nico, you bring up an important point about the grip. You can really damage yourself. You, the grip is, grip work is dangerous work. I'm going to tell you this right now because you can do damage to your fingers, okay? You, you have to watch. Um, like a lot of music, oh, and another thing, I used to do stretching exercises for my fingers too. Like, I can't, like you know, just starting to like stretch them, you know, a little bit like, I don't know if you can see it, but you know, ah, I can't, I can't, I can't see my camera. So I can't really tell you, but you can put it on a table and start working your, uh, stretching your fingers, but you have to be careful. You don't, because this is delicate. You talk to any virtuoso musician, they're, they're, they're leery of doing a lot of things with their fingers because they can't afford a tendon injury because that'll be it. Okay. For them, they'll, you and I probably could have that tendon injury, recover, and never notice the difference. But there, they would know know the difference. And so, as years gone went by, by the time I was eighteen, nineteen, 
well, I was already playing the drums when I was a kid, but then I got into the jazz accordion. And then I kind of was worried about my fingers then. You know, I had a watch because I wanted to become, you know, <laughs> the world's best jazz accordionist, right? I wanted to play jazz with like Charlie Parker could play the sax. So I was like more alert and kind of um, hesitant to do some of the stuff with my hands because I just didn't, didn't want to injure them. And then as years went by and I told you I had those health issues where I knew that I was never going to be a top player, then it didn't matter anymore. Then I started doing, then I started going nuts with my grip because it didn't matter then if I had a tendon injury it would heal, you know, but I don't advise being reckless. So, you know, one thing I will say out of all the injuries I've had, I mean, I've had broken fingers from fighting, but that's different, but I've never knock wood injured my fingers. If, if you saw them up close, they're crooked. They're all of that from just getting grabbed and twisted and you know, all that and broken. But I, I never injured the tendons or the muscles in my hands, which is, um, I'm very grateful for that. Yeah, I know a guy that I, I trained with at the wrestling club, and he always tells me every time I see him pretty much, he's, he's like, you should really learn how to play the piano because it's, it's going to help your wrestling. It's going to help your grip and everything. And he's, he said all the, all the exercises he does to play the piano really translates over to his wrestling. Did you notice that with the accordion? Oh, yeah, well, you do special exercises. They're called Hannon, Cherney, Philippe. Um, I'm sure there's a bunch of other ones, but those were the, the elite exercises. Um, no, I didn't, make the, uh, I didn't make the correlation that way uh, because, like I said, my grip was always be good. Um, but he's not wrong. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of – it will help you with your independence and so on, but – I can tell you this, I've been around some of the best musicians, keyboard, you know, either piano, accordion, whatever, not talking horn or, or guitar. And um, none, none of them had any kind of special grip. As a matter of fact, I was always respectful and never wanted to put a crusher on one of those guys. I never wanted to shake their hands hard because, you know, this is their living, okay? You got to treat these things delicately when you're a jobbing musician, you know, or, or a concert artist, you know? Um, so, yeah, uh, but you, that guy that you're talking about is not wrong. You know, I mean, it, it can relate. I was already beyond that. I already had developed my grip strength well. Um, but I think a lot of people don't, they, they have this aversion to having strength. This is one of the most silly things, but they think a strong man, I'm being general, generalizing here, but they think a strong man doesn't have technique. Oh, he just used strength. That's so wrong. You know, there, there's nothing stupider than that comment. And I mentioned it on one of my videos. Uh, you cannot have technique in the absence of strength. If you had no strength, you wouldn't be able to move. So the stronger you are, the better you're going to be. Your techniques are going to be even that much crisper. Granted, there's a lot of people who use their strength as a crutch to get away. They can power out of something. But if the guy can power out, that's not a knock on the guy powering out. That's a knock on you. Your technique wasn't good enough. Because if you know, especially with the way I teach, which I believe, and I've said this before, is the highest level of technique out of any grappling art, uh, you're not powering out of this. You're, you're powering out of nothing. And I've showed that with you guys, how you can make yourself, you can make me weak and negate my strength. So having strength is no different than having flexibility or, or, or being able to run a four-minute mile. It's nothing that should be, you should be made ashamed of. It's a good thing to have. And if, if, if somebody's powering out of your techniques, that means you got to work on your techniques. There's something wrong with you, not, not the strong man. I heard a guy once say, you can never be too strong, too technical, or too fit. You know, there's, there's no limit, really. Is you, you, you want to maximize as many as you, as you can. Um, to a degree, I mean, there's a point of diminishing returns. You know, it, I've, and I've used, I've, I've talked to guys who are super strong and I've told them, okay, you got more strength than you'll ever need. Uh, in order to maintain, let's say that thousand pound squat, your diet, your amount of hours in the gym are going to start taking away from your fighting ability. And then you want to have a body that's lift. You don't want to be a, like a, a structure, you know, that's immo immovable. Um, 
And when you're bigger and stronger, you know, your body, your cardiovascular system, that's a strain on it. Okay. So you want to be athletic. Um, so there is a balance. Okay. This is not like a storybook where you could just like magic wand and all of a sudden we're all bent in a thousand pounds and squatting 1500. No, it takes an incredible amount of, of work to get to, you know, record strength levels and, Every hour you're spending lifting, you're taking away from the technique time. So it's a balancing act. This is, this is the thing. It's like walking a tightrope. And everybody's schedule is going to be different. Everybody's um, strengths and weaknesses, not strength, physical strength, but, you know, their characteristics um, are going to be different. There's people who are just naturally stronger than others. Like me, I was not naturally strong. I was naturally, naturally fast. I have a lot of fast twitch muscle fibers. You know, I could throw punches fast as a kid. I could run. I was always the, the fastest kid on in everything I played. Basketball, football, baseball, track. I was always the fastest, right? So I, I didn't have that strength. I worked for it. Um, but in the scheme of life, how strong was I? You know, I told you already, 480-pound bench. Okay, that sounds good, but that's not record strength by no means, you know? Um because I never wanted it to consume me so much that it started to work against my fighting ability. Everything I did strength-wise was to augment my fighting ability. That was the first and foremost thing. Um, and then, of course, with the curls, the curls, doing, getting my arms so strong did not take a lot of time. Okay? I mean, as far as the workouts. Okay. Um, and, and, yeah, I became – pretty obsessed with that having the strongest arms in the world is what I wanted you know I just wanted to be super strong and it paid off dividends because once I grabbed a hold of you you weren't getting out I don't care who you were you're not getting out <clears throat> and that that works on the your opponent's psyche a lot you know <laughs> my god I can't break this guy's grip or you know I can't get out of this oh my god what's next so yeah, it's just everybody has their own take on it. I mean, th this is just my take on things. You know, some of, some of the, in the listening audience may kind of want to disagree, but I, I can all I can say is it's always worked for me. So I'm beyond my my prime years now, but um, I outside of the injuries that happen on a, a fluke occasions, uh, I wouldn't change a thing. That's going back to kind of your, the advantages of the grip strike. That's one of the impressions I had too, is that, you know, even before the technique is happening, if you've got a really strong grip, the person, the minute you grab a hold of them, they're already in pain, you know, even without a technique, let's say. So if I, if I've grabbed their foot, but I've got a crushing grip, even though I doesn't, don't necessarily have a, you know, submission hold on them yet, it's already put them in a, you know, a, a, in a frame of mind, you know, it's already kind of, uh, they're already under, you know, distress because just the grip strength alone uh, can have an impression. At least that's been my experience. When someone has a strong grip, uh, the minute you put your hands on them, they're thinking about tapping. Well then, yes, of course, but <clears throat> don't be a show and no go guy, you know, have that grip strength, but then crank it, you know, put, put the, put the hurt on. And, and like I said, many times it's about, the way I teach is to put the person, the opponent, in an unnatural position. That weakens them. So now they have to do two things. Psychologically, their body is like contorted, let's say. And they're thinking, okay, I've got to right the ship here. I got to get my body in, in, in the correct functional position. So they've got to work against themselves before they're even working against you. So then they're not going to get themselves back into the righteous position the way they should be. And, it, and they're going to know that quickly. I mean, we're, we're talking within a second or two. And all of a sudden now, since they're helpless like a child, because their strength has been taken away from them, um, you can pretty much do what you want with the guy. And that's the beauty of the way I teach. And nobody else does it. Nobody. I've, I've seen no one. And unless they were trained by me or they watched my videos, because there's so many doing it the other way, which is more relaxing. It's kind of easier. You know, it doesn't hurt as much, and blah, blah, blah. But to a man, everyone who's ever come to train with me, even if it was just at a seminar, a one, one shot deal, they're like, my God, does this stuff hurt? I can't believe it. I've never felt anything like that. I never felt anything like that. 
Well, that's the way it should be. You know, um, that that's, you know, I'll take a line from the movie, The Natural. Welcome to the majors. You know, now you're, you're seeing the way the body, how it can be at the highest level possible, you know, technique wise. Um, and that's why people don't power out. And it isn't because I'm physically stronger than them. It's because I've put them in a helpless position. Like, like Javier, you know, he's won world championships using my stuff and he's a small guy. When he, when I let him put that top wrist lock or whatever the move is on me, I'm not powering out of it because he's made me completely um, unnatural. You guys too. You guys have put it on me and I can't power out because you've made me um, weak, but you put me in it in a traditional way, like the other schools, I'm out. I can, I can get out of that, you know, um, you know, no problem. Especially when I was, you know, in top shape, you can muscle out of it. Um, you know, that there's, <laughs> yeah, it, it's just, just, just all that, it's all there is to it. So yeah, but having that grip, man, that's really something. And I've gotten into trouble with my grip. You know, um, I've gotten to the point where I don't really shake people's hand hard anymore because, you know, people would bitch and complain about it. Oh, you screw, oh my God. You know, I've had so many nicknames. They used to call me the robot out here when I moved out here because I had a grip like that, right? So I'm like, Jesus, this is, I don't even have a grip like I used to have before I was all banged up. So you got to kind of watch. That's how Rod Bond was. Same thing. People would yell, you get mad. They think he was doing it intentionally. My mom used to tell me that he would never shake a lady's hand because he didn't have control over his grip strength. He was just a freak. I'm, I'm not a freak. You know, I could control my grip strength. My grip strength wasn't like his. It wasn't even remotely as good as his. But it was strong enough to get people mad, you know. Um, and I never did it to – um, it's just one of those things. You know, I'll just, I'll just grip you. And, uh, you know, one of the first things you, you learn as a man is, you know, I don't want to shake hands with somebody who's got a wet noodle there. You know, I want – your handshake means a lot. It used to be that your hand, a handshake was your word of honor, was your bond. And I still believe that. So when I grip you, you're going to get not only a firm grip handshake, but you're getting a guarantee on my word. Now, most people this day and age, oh, I got to get things in writing. Well, back in my day growing up, this was your writing. This was your word of honor. So my word is going to be as strong as I can make it. My grip is going to be as strong as I can make it. That's just my old fashioned way of thinking. Yeah. I noticed uh, your handshake a lot when I fractured my hand, probably, <laughs> I don't know, six months ago. And uh, yeah, I went to your house and you shook my hand. I wanted to scream, but I didn't say nothing because it hurt so bad. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, well, I've run into some freaks too. I've run into guys, um, Two guys in Chicago, one I'll never, I don't, I don't know the guy, I only met him once, some Pol didn't even speak a word of English. And, um, and then uh, John McDonough, an Irishman from Ireland, a uh, smaller guy, he had an incredible grip in his fingers. He couldn't move them this way. I mean, he, he, the guy had a great grip. I always say he's got the second best grip of anybody I ever shook, Rod Von being number one by far. But McDonough had a, has a, has a real good grip. Um, I, I haven't seen him in several years, probably seven eight years maybe longer so i don't even know if i think he's still alive but i heard he has some health issues so i don't i don't know how his grip is anymore but yeah grips grip is important to me but arm strength is is equally important if not more you know when my biceps were, were, were cooking man you know i like i said i grip you body lock you and uh is what i mean and uh you know it, it just changes things you know um it, it's it's just an incredible uh, thing to for me to not have that kind of you know because of these injuries you know not curling like I used to curl kind of bothers me and I don't try to think about it because right now there's nothing I could do um, but there was a time when I was I was pleased with myself I was pr pretty happy with what I what I had but uh, you know it can get you in trouble you know people want to arm wrestle you they want to do this or that you know it's always something. Tony, how do you develop endurance for the arms, for like the biceps? Well, um, I used to do uh, even, and this includes the bench press as well, um, uh, burnout set, as I would call it, where I would do a lot of low, low weight, low weight, high reps. So like on the bench, 
um, I would end up my last set many times. I would just put, excuse me, one, oops, 135 and then just, you know, muscle out like 50 reps as fast as I could at the end. Okay. Just to pump, flush the blood. And I would do that also with the, um, with the curls. I would just, you know, lighter weight, high reps as, as the last set. Um, and when I was doing, when I was training for my push up world record, that 60 second thing, that was another thing that I would do. I'd, I would bench for 60 seconds fast, you know, lightweight naturally, and just try to boom, 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 get that up there um, and just keep working at it. So, yeah, I would do a lot of high reps, but one set only, okay, as a, as a finish after my uh, working sets, I would, I would flush out my, my, my body like that. Um, there was times where, you know, my arms would be like this, literally, I couldn't put them down, okay, for like three, four minutes, because you got all that uh, lactic acid, lactic acid or whatever, uh, just, oh, I used to tell people, I'm like, you know, if anybody wanted to kick my ass, this is the time, <laughs> the minute I'm done lifting, because I couldn't even move, there's nothing I could do, give me an hour, then maybe all right, <laughs> but uh I miss those days, man. I, I, I really, truly do. You can't lift like that in these, in these commercial gyms, you know. I mean, maybe if you go to a um, bodybuilding gym or powerlifting gym, maybe. But, I, you know, I'm almost 60 years old. It's, you know, eh, no, I don't need that anymore. But, um, yeah, so I would do a lot of high reps and quickly, you know, quick, quick reps. You know, not just one, two, you know, to, the, to 100 and boom, boom, boom. You know, that, that I, I would do that. And you're fine because you're already thoroughly warmed up. Just watch for hyperextensions. You know, don't like hack out your elbows like that. So you get, you know, an injury, just boom, 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 boom. And don't go just like partial. You got to go three, like at least down to, I don't know if you can see, at least down to here, you know. And um, yeah, and it just, it, 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 and I think it helped me not become, I hate this term, but not become muscle bound because I would always still, you know, throw out. Afterwards, I'd work my hand speed, you know, I'd make sure that I still had, I could throw punches quickly and everything. So I wasn't becoming encumbered by, you know, my arms. And I never got gigantic arms. The biggest my arms ever were right around 19 inches. So I wasn't like a 22, 24 inch, you know, freak. Because again, that's, it's going to slow you down. I thought 18 to 19 inches on my, on my frame was about the perfect size for my biceps. And I never bodybuilded. I was never a bodybuilder, so I didn't do the traditional bodybuilding exercises. Uh, I just, you know, lifted for strength and, and uh, speed and, you know, kind of along the way, muscular endurance with that. Because there'd be times I'd be done lifting, doing those quick reps, and I'd be like out of breath. <laughs> the other thing about hands and grip strength and, and kind of – you know, there's the offense with it, but it's also defense. The, the fingers are a target, you know, and having some strength and, and resistance there, you know. And the other thing I've, so I think that's probably just beneficial there because some people are going to be grabbing for them. But the other thing I notice is how often people don't train with that in consideration. I mean, I know like in sport wrestling, it always kind of disturbs me a little bit that it's come so far that like when they're in the referee's position, they always start with their fingers splayed out on the mat. You know, and it's just kind of something that's lost in a lot of people's training is that your fingers are a, a, a nice, easy target and you need to be defending them. That, Joe, that's absolutely right. I've, I've experienced that firsthand. So you guys remember when I broke my finger at work, uh, I had it all taped up and stuff. I didn't even know it was broke for like a couple weeks. So I went training. I went, I was at the wrestling club and um, wrestling with this really big guy, probably close to 200 pounds. And uh, he couldn't take me down. He was struggling, having a hard time. I put him in a front headlock, and I had my finger all taped up. This guy grabs the finger. He knew which one to grab because it was all taped up. He grabs it and just twists it, like, hard, like, snapped it. And I actually heard a snap. So it actually rebroke at that moment, and I was done, man. I mean, that was, that was it for me. That, when that finger broke, th there's really not much I could have done. I only had one arm to work with. But uh, I experienced that firsthand. I mean, all you got to do is twist one finger and you're almost helpless at that point. Correct. And that's why back in my day and before my time, it was like when you're on the ground, you make a fist, you know, or, you know, you, you tuck those hands in. Or the, I mean, uh, you tuck your fingers in so people can't 
grab on them. But, you know, um, in many matches, sport grappling or whatever it is, you know, there's no small joint manipulations. You can't go for the fingers. You can't go for the wrist, things like that. Um, that's for safety's sake. But, yeah, it gives you – it lulls you into a false sense of security, um, you know, without a doubt. I mean, I told you earlier today I've gotten my fingers broken, twisted, mangled, of course. You know, people try to grab onto them and just crank, crank, crank. Um, not today, but – maybe on another show, let me, uh, remind me to tell you my story of my, uh, my, uh, thing with, uh, Doug Bluebaugh, the Olympic gold medalist in 1960, um, when him and I met and what happened, it was actually pretty, pretty cool. Um, <laughs> really, uh, but yeah, you know, fighting, at least the way that I fight or was taught is, is the most violent thing in the world. Um, you know, where people are trying to kill you. Okay. Uh, where you can die uh, from a weapon or multiple assailants or, you know, just from a beating, right? So you, you have to look at yourself. You have to analyze yourself and become impenetrable. You have to have, in essence, no weaknesses. Somebody once asked me, what, is it more important to have great, you know, strengths technique-wise or no weaknesses? And to me, it's no weaknesses first and foremost, Um if in a perfect world, you know, you want to really work on your weaknesses and make sure that they're minimized or extinguished. And that's what I do as a coach. You know, I look at you and I find out where, what's wrong with you. Uh, it's a negative approach. You know, I look at the negatives in you and I try to work on your negatives. So you're no longer, you know, that bad because um, your strengths are going to be there and then we can easily augment those strengths. But it's the weaknesses where you can be like this, like the story you just told now, you, the guy couldn't take you down. You had him in the front headlock. You were about ready to do your thing. And the guy capitalized, be it intentionally or in, unintentionally, but it sounds it was intentional. He capitalized on one of your weaknesses. You had a broken finger. He went for it. You were vulnerable. I discussed this in my Snap No Tap video series. I was really banged up then. I had a broken hip. I had a torn labrum, broken collarbone, bicep detached over here. And yet I said in the small Snap No Tap, nobody cares about that on the street. They're not going to cut me any slack. If I signed for a pro fight that, that week or whatever, they'd cancel the fight, all right? It would be called off. <laughs> Not in the real world. Nobody gives two shits about you if you're hurt. They're, they're like a predator, man. They smell weakness. They're going to go for it. So you got to fight through it, man. You got to do what you can. You were a gentleman. You could probably took take taking the guy's eyeball, you know, kicked him in the nuts. You could have done whatever. I wasn't there. I don't know. I didn't see it. But you could have done something, but you chose not to, which is good. The guy was a jerk off. And, um, you know, guys like that, their time comes, you know. Um, and it may not even be in, in a wrestling mat. You know, it just seems like what you put out in the world will come back to you. And maybe somebody will screw them over in a business deal or something. Who knows? But people like that, man, you know, I, I threw somebody out of my gym for, for a similar reason like that. He was, you know, he knew that the kid had an injury. We kept telling him over and over and over. And he went to attack, attack the guy's injured limb. Goodbye. You're out. Get, get out. Don't ever come back. And um, yeah, you, you know, there's, there's, when you're training, there's, you know, you got to be kind and gentle, but, but when you're really, when you've de dedicated your life to becoming uh, a, a survivor and you really want to learn the highest level of fighting, I don't care what style it is that you're doing, you've got to realize that anything goes on the street. And that was unfortunate for you, Nico, but you learned a valuable lesson. You know, this guy didn't care. Now imagine if he wanted money. He was on the street with an arm with a knife or a gun. Think what it could have happened. He would probably not have had a problem pulling the trigger or, or, you know, sticking you like a, you know, cutting you up like a Thanksgiving turkey, man. Who knows? So, you, you, you know, you, you got to be prepared for all this shit. You just, you just have to. And I've talked to, on videos about practicing with one arm. You know, like when your arm is in your practice with one arm, practice blindfolded. I was going to film that on the snap, no tap, but we ran out of time. Um, I was going to do a whole thing on fighting blindfolded so where you can't see and shit. Um, you know, you, 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 you've got to, and every one of us knows our own weaknesses, okay? All of us are unique in that we may have a special injury or we may, we may be vulnerable to something you, you do or you say or a scenario that might trigger a bad emotion in you and, and you know, make you, uh, you know, uh, queasy for lack of a better term. And you got to work on those things, man. If you, if you want to become uh, 
fearless, let's say, uh, you have to work on your weaknesses. That's just, that's just it. Yeah, I, th I think that's one of the, it can be a downfall of, you know, training like a gentleman all the time with other people because you never really anticipate somebody to do a low blow or, you know, take out your injury and exploit it and, you know, just do something that would be considered ungentlemanlike during training. But I think on the streets, I mean, really, that's very effective. Almost oh, definitely, but you know, not just physical, but verbal too. I mean, you know, I've done scenarios training where I've called this guy, scared him, called him every name in the book, this, that, whatever. He got all offended. I'm like, dude, I'm just playing with you. You know, this, this is going to happen in the real world. Guy's going to be coming at you. Your adrenaline's going to be, you know, pumped up. You cannot run. You can't, you know, fight, flight, or freeze. You, you know, you have to become a fighter, okay? Um, you just have to. If, if you're going to protect yourself or your loved one, if you're with your, your friends or family or, you know, whatever. Um, and if you don't think there's anything worth fighting for in this scenario, well, then all right, then try to get out. You know, I can't tell you what to do. We all are our own, we are our own judges in, in that scene. And there have been times, like I said, in my life, where this particular day, let's say, I don't want to get into it with anybody. Maybe I'm all dressed up and I got to go to a wedding or maybe I'm on my way to court for some reason or another. I can't be late. So I'm not going to engage anybody. I'm just going to say, here, here's my number. You want to, you want to fight me here? Call me later. You know, so you, you have to judge it yourself, right? <laughs> it's all about that, you know? Um, but unfortunately I've been thrust into situations, right? And because of my background, I have a lot of friends who take advantage of that as well. When I'm out with them, all of a sudden they, they, they have that courage, right? Somebody staring at them, they'll, they'll lip off because they know that Tony's going to be there to take care of it. Well, I'm tired of that, okay? Um, you know, the, the, those days are gone, right? I, I'm not going to, you know, I will take a bullet for my friends or people who I love, but only if it's, un, you know, if that bullet is unwarranted, right? But, yeah, I learned at a very early age. We discussed this last week, so we don't need to rehash it. But when you're a child and you're a witness to all this incredible violence, violence where it leads to death and you witness this it leaves a it leaves a mark man and it's shit that i'll never i'll go to my grave knowing kind of like a war guy who's seen you know a guy in combat who's seen death you know you never really you don't forget it and you certainly don't make light of it embarrassing moments yeah you may be all worked up about it for a while but 10 years five years go by you can laugh about it well you can't laugh about somebody getting murdered okay or somebody getting nearly murdered um that messes with you. And it's messed me up in my personal life. There's no question about it. Okay. I take certain things serious. Um, but anyway, we're getting pretty, pretty, pretty heavy here. Let's, let's talk about something else that really I wanted to talk about today. Uh, and I mean, Oh, well, no, Joe, you wanted me to talk about something about fighters or something from the past. Yeah. I mean, you have like this kind of, you know, you're, you're kind of an encyclopedia of old time athletes that I think a lot of fighters and, and people would just be interested in. I think that a lot of times they're, it's, it's, it bums me out that I think they're going to be forgotten, you know, if they're not discussed, you know, great athletes that um, for whatever reason just haven't stayed in the popular consciousness. And so I thought it'd be good as, you know, if we just kind of like every episode talk through a couple of them, one or two, just to kind of uh, do our little tip of the hat and kind of uh, create awareness, I guess, and, and, and honor their memory. Okay, well, um, there was a guy, now, his name was Paul Berlenbach. And in the late teens, maybe 1919, 1920, he was uh, AAU wrestling champ, which was the pinnacle in this country, okay? Being an AAU champ meant, you know, you're a national champ. You're the best in the country in your weight division. And then in around 1920s, 23 or something like that, he started to switch to boxing. And by, I think it was by 1925, he won the light heavyweight championship of the world, boxing. Now, granted, um, he may not be considered the number one light heavyweight of all time. It's hard to tell because, you know, back then, that's, you know, almost 100 years ago, you know, we didn't see the fight footage. We don't really know. I mean, maybe experts have. I think he was ranked like number 10 or 12 all time as a light heavyweight. But here's a guy think about this, who was the light heavyweight boxing champion of the world and a national champion wrestler. 
Now, I know Danny Hodge later, he was silver medalist in the Olympics, should have been a gold. And he had some pro fights. But so on paper, I would say Danny Hodge was the better wrestler. Berlenbach was the better boxer. But here's, you know, combo guys. Here's guys that can do both at a, at a high level. Um, and uh, so there, you can call them mixed martial artists. There, there was a lot of guys back then that, that could box and wrestle. That was me. I always wanted that. It's all I ever thought about was, you know, being able to, to do it all. Um, so, uh, yeah, he was a guy that, uh, you know, shouldn't have been forgotten. I think he ended up owning a, owning a restaurant or something like that. He's been gone for, for a lot of years. Um, you know, I don't know exactly when he died, maybe in the forties or something. Um, I don't recall that anymore. Um, but there was a guy that could do it both. And the wrestling back then, now it wasn't exactly, certainly wasn't like what we do, but it wasn't, there were some submission holds as, as well back then. Wrestling was a little, amateur wrestling was a little more um, free with their uh, techniques. They didn't start uh, reeling all the injurious or potentially dangerous holds in yet. Um, make no mistake, they weren't, you know, they didn't specifically train for submissions though. That's, let's get, you know, let's debunk any kind of myth that's out there. But, um, you know, America, that was our, our sport was wrestling. You know, we, we dominated the world, uh, you know, look in the Olympic record, record books, you know, Americans had won a lot of gold, you know, and, uh, something to be, um, you know, proud of. There was another, uh, um, champion wrestler. Again, he was a silver medalist. Uh, and, oh boy, my, my, my brain just went blank. Uh, he was an actor. He, became an actor and he did the, the, the life story of um, Eugene Sandow. And uh, I can't believe my brain just went blank on this guy. Uh, uh, it'll come to me. Anyway, he had, he turned pro wrestling for a while and he did a match or so with John Pesek and in it, uh, two out of three falls or whatever. And Pesek, you know, submitted him or, you know, injured him. And, and uh, but there's debate about that. Okay. There's debate on whether it was a work you know, meaning a fake match, or if it was a shoot, meaning a, a real match. Um, no one knows. Uh, you know, uh, believe me, there was working matches going on from, from the very beginning. Um, what bothers me right now is I can't think of his name, and I know his name like I would know your name. Um, Temple, to, uh, Jesus, I can't think of it. I can picture him too. He just, just had a complete brain freeze here. But um, anyway, he was built nice, nicely built, probably strong, um, and you know, a, a very good, um, good athlete. And again, he made he made the Olympics. So we can go on. I mean, I could talk about you know forty guys, probably not remember one name now. <laughs> but uh, I think one of the biggest enigmas to me was Max Bear. Um, to this day, Max Bear holds a record that's never been um, matched, and that is. He went from the quickest time from never having a boxing match ever, never boxing, to becoming the heavyweight champion of the world. It took about five years, okay? And the legend is that he got into a beef at a dance or a party or something. He knocked out this truck driver with his right hand. Hey, I ought to make money doing this. Started to box, became heavyweight champion of the world. And he's an enigma because, well, first of all, the movie Cinderella Man, forget it. That's, that's, that's Hollywood. It's bullshit. But he had a great right hand, right? And I guess he could pretty, he could take a beating. The problem with him was he just never took it seriously. Um, and when he killed Frankie Campbell in the ring, he never was the same. Uh, it, it just, he, it, he just never wanted, he, did, he lost his killer instinct. He just didn't want to do it. He didn't want to hurt anybody. This guy was a joker, man. He did some movies and hung around with starlets. And, you know, th that's what he was. He was just, he was just, one of the guys, he was like, matter of fact, hotels used to have um, doctors on staff at, at nice hotels in case somebody felt ill or whatever. The day he died, I think he was only like 50 years old. He was in his hotel room and he calls down um, for a doctor. He says, I need some help up here. And the receptionist says, do you want us to send up the house doctor? He said, hell no, I want you to send up the people doctor. I mean, that's the kind of practical joker this guy was. And he died. He died of a heart attack. But he used to dance in the ring, and he would waltz the, the, the opponents and shit. He just didn't take boxing seriously, right? So with his – well, I mean, he took it serious enough to become the heavyweight champ. But, I mean, he could have been 
something even more, but he had a great, powerful right hand. And, um, you know, it's just, uh, it's just a shame that, you know, he, he didn't, he didn't live a long life. Like I said, I think he was like 50 and his son played Jethro on the Beverly Hillbillies, Max Bear Jr. Um, so that always bothered me, you know, that I wonder what he, if, if things were different, what he could have been, right? How, how, how great of a champion could he have been? But then again, you know, Joe Lewis was looming. Joe Lewis was, that was a boxer, man. Um, one of, probably to me, the first modern heavyweight. Um, but yeah, those are, um, and it's still bothering me that I can't think of uh, the wrestler, the actor's name. Uh, I, that's just driving me nuts. So you guys talk about something for a while. Maybe the name will come to me. I, I just got a question. So how did, how did he kill the guy in the ring? Did he just knock him out and the guy you know, went man. into a coma or something? Yeah, something like that, exactly. And then years later, he gave a savage beating to a guy named Ernie Schaff. And then Schaff survived, but then... Uh, I believe it was his next fight. He ended up fighting Primo Canera and he died. Ernie Schaff died in that ring with Canera, but all the writers at the time and boxing enthusiasts said it was Ernie Schaff never recovered from the beating that, um, you know, Max Bear laid on him. Um, so Nat Pendleton, Nat Pendleton. It just came to me. That's the wrestler's name, Nat Pendleton. Anyway, um, it never came, uh, you know, so uh, this is the kind of fero ferocity that, uh, you know, uh, bare head. The, the, I don't know. See, a lot of guys probably have never gotten really hit by like a, like a, a really hard hitter. Um, and imagine getting hit repeatedly, you know, it all, it, sometimes it only takes one blow to really mess you up. Um, and, and even though you may recover in the fight, you may not actually recover, period. I remember talking to Johnny Lira about this um, when he was still alive. And he said, a lot of times it isn't just the repetitive blows that cause, because Johnny was a good boxer. And he's like, sometimes it isn't the repetitive blow. Sometimes it's only just one, just one punch in one fight that will forever change you. It'll trigger the, the problem that'll manifest years later. And uh, he's right because, um, you know, uh, I think some of my problems stemmed from just a couple of shots that I took in fights uh, when I was younger and, you know, not necessarily getting hit a thousand times or something. It was just getting hit. I got hit in the head with pipes and things like that. And it leaves a, uh, yeah, it can mess you up. <coughs> but yeah, uh, to me, Max Bear always was a, you know, um, colorful figure and he was a bigger guy. He wasn't a weightlifter, but he was a bigger guy. I think he was like about six, two or so. And, you know, probably 215, 220, you know, it depends. You know, you can read what the books say, but what did he actually weigh when he weighed in? They, you know, who knows? Um, but yeah, he wasn't, you know, he just was, um, he had a good build for, for, for a heavyweight of that era. You know, it raises kind of an interesting philosophical question too, because kind of the way you described him is that he's, he was very natural and gifted, you know, and it kind of came to him easily. So, uh, and so in some ways, you know, he didn't have to train or, or uh, as hard as the other guys. He didn't have to have, you know, uh, that grit or the, the eye of the tiger kind of a thing. And there's a lot of athletes like that where they're just gifted and they can just kind of without putting in the, the crazy, the work to get there. And so the question is, is you know, what's better a, a way to go through, you know, did the guy who has to bust his ass just to like, you know, to, to work his way up to the top or someone who kind of can kind of walk his way into the championship? There's more to it than that. It, it also depends on your, the caliber of your opponents in your era. It could just be a weak time where you don't have to train super, super hard to be able to whoop somebody's butt. Okay. Uh, so why put in more effort than you need? So you, it's, it's just not cut and dry. And I don't know Max Bear. I can't sit here and say that he didn't work as hard as he could. He probably didn't based on some of the um, reports that I've read. But then again, I, I wasn't there. So I, I can only speculate. I can't, you know, say, you know, for sure. But yeah, I mean, it's like, let's say nowadays when I shoot in pool or something, right? If I got the person I'm playing or the, the group of people, like if I'm on a pool league, you know, if they're not that good, I, I really don't have to try that hard, right? I mean, I really don't even care. If I win, I win, I lose, I lose, I don't really care. But 
if I'm playing a bunch of guys that are as good as Shane Van Boning or something like that, he's the best, one of the best in the world. Well, I, first of all, I wouldn't stand a chance against the guy. But my point is, man, then I'd have to really hunker down and really start practicing. So a lot of it was, um, you know, boils down to your competition. Now, I am not begrudging any of Max Bear's competition. I'm just saying, for the sake of argument, I'm not using him as an example. I'm just saying, sometimes people just – don't need to try any harder. They're like, well, what, what point, what's the point? You know, I'm, I, I'm good enough the way it is. So, and again, I am not saying that's how Max Bear thought. I don't want any misinterpretation, but I have seen guys in other elements that, you know, and I mean, I, I'm not going to mention any names, but you know, just, I've, I've had some guys that I've even trained. It's, they're like, I don't need to work as hard as you want me to, because I'm already winning. Tony, you know, what are you going to do? How are you going to argue with that? Well, it is tough. Yeah. And I mean, but I definitely, and I, without naming names, seeing, you know, footage of people who are partying, you know, you know, a couple of weeks before a big fight or something like that, because they've, they've been coasting for so long or doing so well that you kind of, uh, you lo maybe lose that fear, you know, that you're going to get your ass kicked or you, you just start to um, believe your own hype. You know, that's, it always feels like maybe that's what happened with Tyson a little bit too. Right. You know, like I remember watching some all-star, celebration of Mike Tyson they had Sinatra and everybody and they had dancers and they were just fawning over him and this was right before the you know the Buster Douglas fight and I, I don't know I wasn't watching that closely but I I just had the sense that you know that's not a good headspace to be in where everybody's telling you you can't be beat or you're the greatest of all time you know um uh it seems you know it, it seems very natural to kind of get in a frame of mind where you're you know you've been in this scenario and dominated for so long uh, uh, that you start to uh, take risks that you wouldn't normally. So it just seems like a, a risky headspace to be in. Yeah. Well, you know, I can't speak for Mike. You know, um, he had all the tools. There was a time when I saw him and I thought he was the greatest heavyweight that ever lived. You know, for a brief period of time, you know, um, and I don't care to go into it a little any, any deeper because, you know, um, I just as soon leave it at that. Uh, but, you know, there's been, for me, you know, it, 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 go, it all goes back to some people, and especially in other sports, it's, it's a business, right? Um, especially like team sports, you know, where you can kind of like, you know, it, it's a whole different attitude. And, and I think all of us that have been around great athletes have seen guys who, are, who never really lived up their, to their potential. Um, same with music. You know, I've, I've seen guys that I know could have been um, even better, right, than what they were if their practicing uh, was more dedicated. And, you know, I faltered. I, I could have been better at a lot of things in life if I, if I would have focused more and had a little bit more dedication. But in my defense, I wanted to be the best at several things that none of them really interacted with each other. You know, uh, drums accordion pool strength fighting you know whatever i just wanted speed track you know i i just wanted to be all of these things and and i think that worked against me okay because you can't be the world's best at at at, at everything right you can't you can't even most people can't be the best at, at one thing so that was that's my problem um but i'm i'm sure that if you lived in somebody else's shoes, if you go walk in their shoes you'd, you'd, and look at things from their perspective, might give you a different outlook on things. Um, I think about what could have been with, with people who were never even given the chance. You know, I've seen guys that are kids that I thought could have been somebody, you know, in the athletic world. And life just didn't deal, it just didn't go that way, okay? It just, they didn't get the breaks or Music, oh, that music is riddled with people who are better than anybody you've heard, you know, like in, 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 you know, famous, right? These people have every bit of talent and more. And they're languishing in obscurity. They just didn't get the breaks or whatever happened, happened. You know, um, are you going to let that consume you the rest of your life? Or are you going to try to make the most of what you can? Okay. So this is almost philosophical, but. Believe me, I've, I've seen 
ungodly talent that nobody knows of, you know. Ma magic, too. That's another thing. I never wanted to be a magician. I, I used to like to goof around with card tricks, but I've seen some great card manipulators, okay? Um, you know, they all have day jobs. You know, they do the magic as a hobby. I'm thinking, geez, God, this guy's great. <laughs> yeah, for sure, with music. You, like, even in, I know you're, like, on the jazz side of things, but there's a lot of great bands out there on the rock side that, you know, you, if you're into the music scene and you, you, you get out to bars, you see these bands and you're like, wow, they're better than what I'm hearing on the radio. Why aren't these guys getting out there? But there's a whole industry, you know, like if you're not at the right place at the right time, you know, you could be a great, it, it, it is really kind of special when it comes together and a really good band gets discovered. You know, you, you start to appreciate how rare that is because there are so many bands out there and, and musicians, like you said, that for whatever reason, whether they're not playing the right venues or they don't have a good manager or just whatever, um, you know, and, and it's, it is a shame to, I guess, society as a whole that these a lot of times these things get lost to us you know that there is a a big percentage of talent out there uh for whatever reason and it just doesn't disseminate i think some of that's helped now with kind of like the streaming services where you can you can find bands a lot easier you're not restricted to what's on the fm radio playlist uh but even so like i've just seen a lot of bands who like put out a lot of quality stuff high level stuff and they're not getting found for whatever reason well i'll give you a little insight uh, there was a guy that, when my dad was a young guy in Pennsylvania before he moved to Cleveland, they all had a, a band together. They played everything at the time, country, rock, polkas, whatever. They all came to Cleveland to make it big. Well, this one guy in the band, he played bass. He became legendary, not so much as a player, but as a, um, a record executive. I believe he was with... Uh, Oh, I forgot where he got his start, but you can look him up. And he became a friend of mine uh, when I was a kid. His name is, was, he passed away, Steve Popovich. And anybody in the music business knows who Steve Popovich was. He had, at times, Blood, Sweat, and Tears under contract, Barbara Streisand, Meatloaf, um, a lot, a lot of different groups. And um, it, I believe he was like the youngest executive at the time, like a vice president of whatever the record company was. I forget it now. But Steve told me once when we were hanging out in Cleveland before I moved to Chicago, he's like, because I was really into the drums. I mean, I was like, you know, wanted to be the, uh, the next Buddy Rich. And he's like, you know, I'm going to tell you something. It's, he says, it's not about, and he said, this is music in general. He says, it's not about how good you are. It's about the song. And I never forgot that. He's like, and he's telling you, he was telling me what I'm telling you, that there's a lot of great musicians out there. Like you're mentioning all these bands, probably great. It's about the song. If somebody could, if they could get their hands on a song that's destined to be a hit, now you got something. Now you're going to get the attention. And um, it's kind of tragic, but that's just the way it is. There's, you know, and, and it's a double-edged sword with songwriters too, because a lot of times a songwriter will write a good hit or write a good song, but it won't become a hit because they gave it to the wrong recording artist. Get it in the hands of somebody like Glenn Campbell, um, Gentle on my mind. Glenn Campbell is one of the greatest guitarists that ever lived. He's very versatile, just a sensational. He was part of the Wrecking Crew. He was a studio musician. Well, there was a guy before him that recorded Gentle on my mind, and that song went nowhere. I guess he recorded it at a slower pace and so on and so forth. Well, Glenn Campbell recorded the song, and it made him a giant hit. I mean, it probably helped put make Glenn Campbell a superstar, okay? So, um, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to it, you know, just like in the fighting world or whatever, or athletics. Sometimes the most talented aren't the ones who get the attention. It's the ones who are the most flamboyant, okay? So it's not necessarily even their skill. It could be their shtick, you know? It's, it's, it's things, it's weird. I mean, nothing is cut and dry. You know, it really isn't. Sometimes it's, it's just, there's, there's other elements that at play that we're not aware of that uh, can propel someone you know, to superstardom, uh, be it music, athletics, academics, you know. Yeah, I, I can see that with the fighters. It's, it's a lot of times it's the most entertaining fighter that becomes the most popular, not the best fighter. Well, sometimes effective is, is boring, you know, or not visually stunning. And but like you, 
watching the UFC and things like that, I totally get now how catch wrestling over the years became pro wrestling. You know, people, yeah, they were going to go out of business, right? They need personalities. They need, you know, they need action outside the ring. They, you know, I mean, you look at Conor McGregor and how much he's made. He made money because of his outside. I mean, sure, he was able to win a lot of fights and has some skills, but what really put him over the top and got his attention was all the kind of the pro wrestling a- antics outside of it. It was that it was kind of the double combination. And you realize it is show business, you know, they got to make more people need to be entertained for it. You know, so there's um, absolutely, you know, you, you just see it that if you're going to make a business out of it, uh, you know, and kind of back to Tony's point. Yeah. I mean, there's studio musicians who are virtuosos. You put anything in front of them, they can play it. You know, they, they can, they're perfect, you know, but, if they don't, they can't write a song that anybody wants to hear. It doesn't matter, you know. Um, I mean, that's kind of a, a different realm. But I mean, there are studio musicians who could play circles around the Beatles. You know, the Beatles were maybe average musicians, you know. But it's the songs that push people over the top. And kind of focusing on what the business is and what sells things is kind of uh, where the world's at, you know. Um, yeah, like I said, there's definitely people who can play scales, you know, at the speed of light. But that doesn't matter. Do you have a hook? You know, and that's kind of the X factor, you know, can you, that's the instinct, you know, like, do I have, can I hear the hook that, oh, this is a catchy song or whatever, or a riff on my guitar, you know, and that's the rare thing, Um, you know, as special it is to be a, you know, high level musician um, to break through. Um, But yeah, you're absolutely right too about the song thing. I mean, there's several examples of that where, you know, uh, I think about like Hendrix with uh, Hey Joe, there were three or four versions of that song before he played it and he played it totally different. Uh, you know, he slowed it down and made it kind of a blues song and it took off, but it took his instinct with the song. So sometimes it's not even the song, but how you execute it, you just have the right feel for it. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, that's kind of the, the realm of art, you know, and, uh, um, uh, aesthetics, you know, kind of that, um, uh, that it's different than like a science where you, that gift of finding the, what's going to be popular. Well, too, there's guys that, and gals that just didn't want to tour as well, okay? They weren't going to go on the road, all right? They had, a, they had other things going on in their life. Uh, somebody, you know, emailed me, one of the guys that was interested in the Tri-C program, talking about bringing me out to Australia to do seminars. I'm like, that's not going to happen right now, okay? Because I'm taking care of my mom. And I can't leave. I can't go away for, you know, two weeks or whatever it would be. And think about that back then with, um, you know, people uh, that can't, work or can't hit the road because they got a family, right? They got children maybe and they're, you know, and they're set in their ways and they got a good job being a studio musician. Now, if they leave to go on the road with, you know, Joe's all-star bar and grill band uh, and it bombs in seven months or whatever, they've lost their studio gig. They're not going to come They're not going to get that studio gig back. Somebody else got in that chair and can sight read and do everything probably just as good. Um, so there's there's a lot to it you know it's it's just boy there's a lot to it like i said with me with the sem- seminars yeah maybe once things you know once my mom you know things you know i don't want to say anything to jinx her but you know once she's no longer able to i'm no longer able to take care of her and i have to put her in a home yeah then i'll i'll be able to um hit the road maybe a little bit and do some seminars whatever if if things are opened but um yeah there's a lot of uh like like with pool Okay, there used to be a lot of great, great under the radar pool players that just did not want to play tournaments. Okay, first of all, a tournament is, I don't like tournaments, okay, because it's one and done normally, or you get double elimination, but it's high stress, a lot of, yeah, no money to be made in it and everything. And these road hustlers, man, they would like to just stay under the radar and play every bit as good as the tournament winners. Uh, and, you know, they could play their long sets and, you know, get things more. Uh, accustomed to their uh, strengths and so on. So there's a lot of unsung people, is get, I guess, is what we're, is what we're getting at. Um, that, you know, are like probably co- like mechanics. I'm in the hot rods and things like that. I'm sure there's mechanics around or technicians as they're, as they're called now that can do things, engine building and stuff like that. They can make cars, you know, I never heard of these guys, right? Maybe I don't know they, who they are, but they're probably, you know, damn near as good as the, you know, engineers, from you know Ford and GM who knows but 
be that as it may, you know, we can live in the outside world wondering about the guy down the street or we can worry about ourselves. And all I can do is worry about myself and make myself as good as I could be. Now, let me tell you something. I'll never be as fast as I was when I was in high school. I'll never probably be as strong as I was, you know, in my 30s or 40s. But I can still improve myself right now. You know, I can still make the way I am today, I can improve. I can make myself better today. And it's on me to do it, okay? I don't, I don't have to worry about, you know, what Max Bear did or what uh, Joe Satriani did or something. I just have to worry about me. And I think that's what I try to instill in my students or just even my friends. You know, you can better yourself and you can start immediately, right? You know, by making the determination in my life that I'm not going to eat as much as I did or I'm not going to drink as much alcohol as I did or I'm going to cut back on my cigarette smoking until I'm finally done with it. You know, this is all within our control. Um, and yeah, it's great to look up to someone and, and have that as a goal. Like I told you as a kid, it was Stanko and some other strong men and, and Bob Hayes, this Olympic sprinter, or Jesse Owens, because my grandmother went to high school with him, so I heard stories. And I, I had idols. I had, you know, people that I looked up to, you know, that I wanted to be like. But I didn't want to be them, okay? I just used them as like the lifeline, like the rope. They're holding the rope that I'm trying to climb, and I'm trying to get closer to them in essence, meaning my physicality. I wanted it to approach theirs. Didn't necessarily think I would ever exceed any of them. And that's not the point. The point, again, was just to get using them as an inspiration to get closer to them. You know, Buddy Rich and the, on the drums. Um, it, was a, it was pointless to aspire to be him or be better than him because that just wasn't going to happen. That was the best. But... If it wasn't for Buddy Rich, I probably would have never gotten as good as I did get on the drums, okay? Because that was a lofty guy to aspire to be. So I think all of us should, I mean, here I'm kind of preaching, I guess, but I think those who choose to be athletes have to realize that, you know, your gifts, your strengths are going to be different than the guy that you idolize, right? Um, but it doesn't matter. You can still reach the summit of your abilities if you have the de dedication, the burning desire, and you have, the you have to have the proper guidance. You know, you have to have somebody that can help you. You can't do it alone, okay? There's no such thing as a self-taught musician. That's all bullshit. There's no such thing as a self-taught fighter. We all pick from other people, whether consciously or subconsciously, okay? Um, and Yes, there's musicians that may not have had formal training, but they're still not self-taught. They heard somebody else do something that caught their ear. They're going to try to do it. Or they played with a bunch of guys, and those guys kind of gave him ideas and so on. So in that regard, there's nobody that's self-taught like that, um, at least no, nobody I've ever met. So I don't know what you guys think, but for me, I, I know I – I left nothing on the table when it came to upper body strength. My upper body strength, I honestly can, if I died today, I know I probably hit 99.99% of my maximum upper body strength. So I can live with that. I, I, I honest to God can live with that. My sprinting speed, I could have been faster. Than, I, went, I ran a 10, 600 meter dash in 1982 when the world record was 9.95. And I really didn't have great coaching. I actually had detrimental coaching, shin splints and everything. I think I certainly could have been faster if I would have had proper coaching. So in that regard, I could have been faster than what I was. But as far as my, my fighting, I think I was as good as I could get. I, I don't see me getting any better. I think I hit the pinnacle with my fighting. I hit the pinnacle with my strength. Everything else in my life, I could have been better. This is a pretty profound uh moment this might be a good time to uh tie things up what do you think yep okay uh well i just want to thank everybody for for listening and and watching and you know I, I, normally we we talk about more bs uh, <laughs> like current affairs or what's going on in chicago or something like that but today's kind of been a serious note yeah i don't know what happened here but uh 
I just want to thank everybody for listening. If you're interested in training, like again, I'll put a link down here, but it's catchwrestle.com for DVDs or digital downloads, instant downloads and training opportunities and so on. Uh, yeah, I just want to thank uh, Joe and, and Nico and what do you guys have to say? Yeah, thanks for the show, you guys. No, it was a really good time. Yeah, absolutely. Learned a lot. All right, guys, and we'll meet up next week, and uh, we'll, we'll go from there. All right. Next All right. week. Have a good week, everybody. Have a good week. Right. Bye-bye. <laughs>